Okay. Yep. Um, the main talk I'm going to give this afternoon is uh, the AV syncing feeling about synchronising non-synchronised recordings. Before I do that, I'm going to just give a really, really quick uh, two-minute update on the FATO project, which I spoke about at last LCA. Um, there are a number of to-dos on our list, and I just want to briefly report where we're up to on that and uh, where things are going. <coughs> So just for those who aren't initiated, the FATO project basically is uh, something that works in conjunction with Jack and allows you to use Firewire audio interfaces under Linux. Uh, the latest milestones in the project, after about 18 months in RC, I think it was, we finally released 2.0 uh, in mid-December um, 09. We're just getting ready for, a, for the... Uh, predictable 2.0.1 bug fix release, uh, which hopefully will come out in a month or so's time. And among other things, this will this contains a patch that allows FATO to run under the new kernel Firewire stack that a number of distros are now starting to make noises about making the default. It does require a, a just released version of Liberal 13.94, but hopefully the distros will pick that up at the same time as making the new stack the default, so that's good. Uh, the 2.0 release uh, contains basically support for devices for which we got manufacturer support for. So this is manufacturers that gave us example hardware and or documentation that we could do a fairly good job of implementing um, a driver for. Um, it also includes the um, Moto drivers, which I basically worked out from protocol analysis that I described last year. We're currently working towards a 2.1 release. Um, there'll be some additional device support, some, uh, some of the uh, newer Focusrite stuff, Behringer, TC Electronic. Again, they're manufacturers who have, in fact, supported the effort with example devices. Um, I also mentioned last year that um, RME were looking good with respect to manufacturer support. It took a couple of months longer than we'd hoped, but eventually uh, did come through with documentation and answers to questions and, and various other things. Um, and the work on that driver is proceeding. I'm the one who's doing that. I don't know how long it's going to take before it's usable. I want to make it usable sooner rather than later because I want to use the device myself. Um, but real life gets in the road a bit as well, so it tends to slow it down. What is working on those devices now is basic control, so I can um, control phantom power and control and know how to control mixes and, and um, all the basic device control. And uh, what's lacking currently is the important bit, streaming audio. Um, that's going to be a little bit interesting to integrate it to the way FATO does things, but um, it should be doable in a reasonable amount of time. And then finally, uh, where we're going, um, we want to make further improvements to the user space streaming engine that we have. It currently still consumes a little more CPU than we would like. Um, and so there's ongoing work to um, find ways of improving that. Obviously, we want to expand the device support to a certain extent that requires um, manufacturers to get on board and give us documentation about how to drive their devices. Um, and that's, you know, basically where grassroots lobbying is starting to produce some results in that respect. And then the final thing is um, we've got a sort of a side project to move the streaming engine into the kernel to avoid a lot of the real-time problems that we're having with that sitting in user space. Um, Google Summer of Code project was involved in um, do it coding up at a proof of concept that's pro it's probably about 12, 15 months away from actually being usable and being merged into the bra uh, into trunk at this stage. But that may speed up depending on how much time people get to spend on it. And uh, there's a few links there. Uh, the important thing I'll just make a note of too is that um, the Linux Firewire home used to be at linux1394.org, I think it was, I'm not quite sure what the circumstances were, but somehow we lost the domain. I think someone forgot to renew it or something. Um, so all things Firewire to do with Linux are now on that kernel.org URL um, as, a, as a first port of call. So, yeah. And that's 
That's it for the, uh, for the photo update. Are there any questions about that in particular? No? So I will move on. So my main talk this afternoon is about synchronising unsynchronised devices. So um, I'll just basically run down what the problem is, outline two possible solutions, um, and then more or less take you through the workflow that I've developed over the last probably seven to ten years of, of um, doing live recording of events with devices that can't, for various reasons, be synchronised to each other. The problem, with, the problem we're trying to solve is that of having recordings from multiple digital recorders whose sampling clocks are not synchronised with each other. They're not locked in any way, so they're free running relative to each other. If they're, they're unlocked, there's no shared clock, and this means that there's clock drift between the two different recorders. And the consequence of that is that if you then play those independently recorded streams back on a given piece of digital hardware, the actual real time length of those recordings differ. And so the supposed end of one recording will happen before or after the end of another one. And if we look at this diagram here, we've got four different devices here. They've got unlocked clocks. If we sort of take device one as our um, notional real device, device two we see has a clock that's running slightly slower, so its sample is just a little bit later than device one's. Device three, although it is sampling very close to the speed of device one, it's offset in time, so its samples don't quite line up with device one. And then uh, the fourth device is running a little bit faster than device one. And the consequence of this is if you take a fixed time period, you'll see that while device one has five samples in that time, the middle two have four and the last one has six, which means if you take that, those four devices and you played, them, you played that sample through, um, on a sound card or something, um, they'll be shorter or longer, even though they span the same real recording time. Now, when you're recording over minutes, this doesn't matter. Right? The clock drift isn't that bad. Um, however, if you start recording over hours, which is the sort of thing I've been doing, then there is a, a real problem. Now, if you want to synchronise all this stuff, there are two basic solutions to this. The first obvious way is you use a common clock. Um, if you're only recording audio, this is relatively easy. You can get fairly cheap commodity hardware these days that contains an input, what's called a word clock, which is nothing more than a BNC connector with a square wave on it um, at the audio frequency. And you generate this in a master clock generator and you distribute this to all your devices, and everything is therefore sampling at exactly the same time, exactly the same rate, and there's no complication. If you're using video cameras, this gets slightly trickier, because unlike the audio case, getting a video camera that has a word clock input on it suddenly starts costing many times more than the consumer cameras that I can afford and what most other people can afford as well. Um, what you can do is uh, what's actually described in that second diagram there. You can get your camera to feed its video to a master clock generator, which is capable of taking the video frame rate that it's getting through that video signal, generating an audio sample clock that's locked to that, and then use that to drive your audio interfaces. Um, that can work. Um, the problem with doing that is that Either that master clock generator box becomes horrendously expensive, or for the cheaper ones, if the video clock stops for any reason, someone trips over a cable or something, the generated clock also stops, which means that if you're recording a live event, someone trips over your feed between your camera and your master clock generator or it falls out or something, suddenly your multi-track audio recording stops which is kind of disastrous. It's ideal that if the video comes out, 
that at least the audio is clocked still so you don't lose the recording and you can salvage something in post-production. Now, none of those were really available to me. It was far too expensive. And so I had to look at ways of overcoming this problem. The second solution is to resynchronize all this stuff in post-production. And it is tedious. And I'm hoping to give an, out, an outline as to how I've done that and sort of optimised as best you can. And the insight that allows this to work relatively easily is, that, is to realise that if the clocks are unsynchronised, then if you take a given data stream and look at it relative to, your, to a chosen master stream, what that looks like is just that your second stream hasn't been sampled at exactly 48k. It might be 48.0001k relative to this other device. And so in terms of the difference in, in speed of, of uh, sampling, we can fix this effectively through resampling. And uh, this diagram's a modified version of the first one. The solid dots are, again, the actual top points in time that those devices were sampling at. The, circle, the open circles are the times at which we really want the samples to have occurred. And we can make one into the other by doing a resample in post-production. In the case of device three and four, there's a bit of a time shift required as well, but you can more or less ignore that in practice because the actual amount of time there is less than one half of a time period. So it's much, much less than a millisecond and it's imperceptible. Just an aside um, for those who are interested in, in the sort of recording workflow that I've used in the past when doing this sort of stuff, um, I tend to just record the video straight to DV tape. Um, the audio I'll capture using Jack Capture. Usually if it's a large multi-track project, you know, eight, eight, 16 channels. If it's a simple two-track thing that I don't really need the multiple channels for, um, I'll just capture straight off the ALSA device. I use a thing called BatchRec that I wrote um, to do this, but any, any standard recording thing will work. Um, and then for simplicity, the format is WAV Broadcast WAV, WAV64, depending on the projected length of these files. If it's a multi-track, I'll usually do WAV64. Um, just to avoid complications with the standard WAV file that craps out at 2 gig. Um, four now, yeah. Oh, yeah, four. Yes. Um, except in buggy software. <laughs> no, you don't. Others do. Um, and then once the event's finished, I'll then recapture from the DV camera just using DV grab and write to a QTDV file, which is just a QuickTime container with the DV, raw DV, and uh, put inside it. Um, if you were doing studio recording, uh, quite simply, you'd probably do it properly in the first place. You'd use the distributed word clock and stuff. If you've got the money to hire a studio, um, you've got the money to run multiple interfaces in sync in the first place. Um, if you were doing it, Ardor would be the obvious choice for doing that recording. You could also use Jack Capture and load it in later. I tend to stick with Jack Capture in my rig, more or less, because when I'm recording a live performance, I don't need the GUI overhead in the system, and I'd rather just minimise the system overhead completely. Jack captures a nice command line thing; it doesn't take any resources, um, and it just and it works. So, resynchronising in post production. So, for the purposes of this exercise, I've just sort of come up with some arbitrary definitions here. Um, the project rate is just the rate that the project's going to end up being, so the notional rate. Um, so that might be 48k if you're ultimately going to DVD, or it might be 44.1 if you're ultimately going to CD. Um, usually you'd sort of choose the rate similar to what you ended up recording in the first place. Um, then we've got the, a, a given stream's real rate, which is the actual rate of that stream if we use our chosen master as our time base. So in the little diagram that's on the screen, we've got a project rate of 48k, and so we say, OK, let us assume that the samples in our chosen master are at exactly 48k. 
what, were, what was the speed of all the other streams relative to that. And so we say that the master's, the master's clock period is one forty-eight thousandth of a second, and our slave stream clearly in that drawing has a period that's slightly longer than that. And you do the maths and it comes out that it's, in this particular example, 36K. In real life, it won't be that obvious. Um, to give you some idea in the gear that I'm using, um, relative to my video camera, most of the audio interfaces are running at around about one hertz high. So if my video camera is putting out notional 48K, then um, audio interfaces appear to be running at 48,001 hertz or thereabouts. Um, over three or four hours of recording, that amounts to around about 20 milliseconds of difference and it's horrendously noticeable. There's a minor inconvenience. For audio-only projects, we can basically digitally resample anything. So it doesn't re to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter uh, what master we choose. Resampling, thanks to Eric's software, is really easy um, and it's well understood and it can be done to a very high quality. What we can't do is resample video frames. What this means is that if you've just got a bunch of individual audio recorders that are recording, you want to synchronise them, um, you just basically choose the one that's got the best clock, the most stable clock because then you won't have to degrade that by doing a resample on it. If you've got a video source, that video source is really going to define your master time base because there's nothing that you can do to resample those video frames. So to a point, those video frames are defining your time base. If you've got multiple video sources, in most cases you choose your close-up camera for this. And the reason is because if you've got clock drift relative to the other cameras, then because they're a wider frame, you don't see as much detail of the things generating the audio, and so the lag is less obvious. To keep everyone sane, it's best, in my opinion, to have all the video recorders running continuously, which basically means you start them at the start and you stop them at the end. Um, rather than, and if that means that if you've got a mobile one, you don't stop it in the middle, you just pick it up, carry it, put it down and keep going. Um, because otherwise you lose your timing of the clips that you really want relative to, relative to your master and you've got to do a lot of frigging around in post-production to work out where those fit relative to the master, master camera again. It, it can be done but it's messy and awkward and this is complicated enough without having to worry about that sort of thing. Two brief asides. Um, the cheaper DV cameras that are out there run what's called unlocked audio. What that really means is that while over the short term the audio clock, drift, the audio clock drifts relative to the video clock, over the longer term it's always pulled back. So whilst over a very short period of time, the audio clock might be running slightly fast. It then is slowed down by the hardware in the camera and catches up with real time, so there's no long-term drift. Unfortunately, that's the, the long and the short-term behaviour is mandated by the DV standard. Unfortunately, there are some cameras that claim to be DV standard compliant but aren't and um, the now ancient TRV900, which is a camera I've got, is one of these. Um, it re runs a very curious version of unlocked audio whereby the audio clock is completely decoupled, it's not pulled back relative to video, which means when I dump the audio and the video streams out, according to the video stream, a recording might be an hour long, but there's enough samples in the audio for an hour and one minute for example. It's painful. What this means is that before I can do anything with this audio, I've actually got to resample the camera's audio to be 48K relative to its own video frame rate, which is stupid. Um, I got so sick of actually having to do this manually that I wrote a, a little, little applet called Audio Sync, uh, 
which more or less does this automatically. It takes my QTDV files from dvgrab, does all the calculations necessary, um, and produces um, a synchronised audio file that I know is exactly the same length as the video. The second uh, question you may have is, why do I use these QTDV files? A, because they're produced by dvgrab. I realise dvgrab can also do raw dv. The other reason is because the video nonlinear editor that I tend to use, Cinerella, reads QTDV files really well and raw dv files rather badly. So in order to resynchronize all these audio streams that we have, we have to start off by finding what I've called reference events. These are two events. Notionally, we want one at the very start of a recording, one towards the very end of it. So we have maximum, um, so we cover um, things at maximum resolution. Um, and it's an event which is present in all the recorders that you're trying to synchronize. And the idea is you're basically trying to find the sample that corresponds to that event in each of your recorders. Um, I choose to use Audacity for this because it's easy to load the clips in and it's relatively easy to get the information we need. You could use Ardor, that would be fine. Um, it's just a little bit of an overkill for what we're actually doing. So to give some idea of what I'm talking about, um, this is just Audacity. And I've just loaded in a, a random clip, which actually is my eight-year-old daughter playing the piano a couple of months ago. And at the start here, I don't know, can you see the mouse cursor there? Yep. yep. So let's, for the sake of argument, say that we were recording something, and this was the output of one of our digital recorders, and we decided the first, very first note of this clip at the start is our reference, uh, is our reference note. So, so it's just a piano hit. Okay. And in this, uh, you, there's a bit of an art to choosing these master events too. You want something that's going to be fairly well defined in all of your audio uh, tracks that you've got. Um, close mic channels are relatively easy most of the time. If you've got room mics, you've got extra reverb to contend with in the room, and it can sometimes be rather awkward to find precisely where the master event actually uh, hit. In this case here, it's relatively simple. Um, effectively, what I would do is I'll just zoom in on that region, and then on some of the more difficult ones, I may even just blow it right up. And you can see there that we're starting to zoom in close on the, um, you know, getting close to the per sample thing there. And then, to a certain extent, it's a case of saying, well, where does this event start? Does it start here? Does it start there? Does it start on the very first you know, discernible peak. There's no hard and fast rule. I tend to just use judgment on this, and sometimes there's a bit of toing and froing. You, t you pull up one, you think that, oh, yeah, that'll be in all the others, and then you pull up one of the others and find out that, oh, that really can't, you can't see this because someone coughed and the room might picked up the cough and you can't work out where it starts and stops. So there's sometimes a bit of toing and froing. I'll usually choose the mo um, you know, I would probably in this case say that that's roughly where the start is. This, you know, whether you choose it there, whether you choose it here, in the end, if your clip is long enough, it doesn't matter a great deal because the error becomes very, very small. If you've got like an hour of capture and you're out by one or two samples at either end, um, that's not going to produce any discernible drift in the final resampled output. Um, so yes, I would normally choose that one. Now, in order to make things nice and easy, if I go to the View Menu, Set Selection, um, to frames, or samples, sorry, snap to samples. The cursor report down the bottom of Audacity tells you what sample number you're at. And so I will note that sample number. I'll go to the end of the thing, find a similar reference event towards the end, and pick the sample number of that as well. I'll do that in all the multi tracks, or one, mul I'll do all that in each, in a single track from each recorder, and also in the chosen master. That can get rather tedious. So then we know basically our sample reference numbers and all this. And given that, 
we could just use SND file resample from our friend Eric here um, to do this. However, it turns out that once you've got the sample rate or the sample numbers of our reference events, you've got to do some relatively non-trivial calculations to turn that into a, um, a resampling amount. Um, this can often have to be done multiple times if you've got multiple streams from multiple recorders. In the workflow, it gets rather tedious. I got sick of it, basically, having to do it by hand. Um, and also, in certain circumstances, because, just because of the format of the command line options, it just was rather awkward sometimes to get the required adjustment resolution out of the system. And, you know, that's no criticism of the program. It's just that I think it's contained in the examples directory, I think. So, you know, it's an example program. It's, it's meant to show you what you can do. Um, so mostly because I just got sick of having to do that calculation, I extended that audio sync program that I wrote to more or less do this for me. I would tell it the uh, timing of the reference events in the master. I tell it the timing of the reference events in the slave. Um, I give it the slave's audio recording, hit go, and it pre-calculates all of the resampling rate um, amounts or all the re resampling parameters it needs to, calls lib sample rate to do the sampling, and at the end of this process, it spits out a WAV file at the end of it, which is our resampled and hopefully synchronised, um, well, yeah, our, our resampled um, slave, which by now is hopefully synchronised to our master. A little side note to this is that if you resample, depending on the nature of your material, it can cause the output to go above 0 dBFS, which is your notional clip. Now, because audio sync is running um, on floating point format and it's designed eventually to feed all this stuff into Ardor, I more or less ignore that, write to it with um, float samples in the WAV files, which is a valid thing to do, load that into Ardor, Ardor will notice that it goes above 0 dBFS, but Ardor doesn't care because it also uses 32-bit inter uh, float internally. And you basically just treat those over transients as you would normally treat transients in anything. You'll either drop the gain at that point if you're automating volume. Um, you'll just drop the whole channel if it's appropriate. You put limiters on it at the, at the end. You compress it. Again, you just deal with it in the normal sort of way. There's no reason to get upset about it just because this particular intermediate step produced what are technically digital overs. Um, if you were writing out to a WAV file that was, say, 16-bit, then you would need to reduce the gain in order to pr not produce digital overs in that resampling thing. Uh, Lib Audio Sync has a mode whereby it will do that for it. If, you, if it detects that it's going over, it'll restart the sampling rate and crank the gain down in very much the same way that Lib File Resample does um, when it hits the same problem. Um, a quick note about multiple video sources. This can be tricky, um, basically because the video clocks can diverge over time in much the same way the audio clocks can. Um, and the other problem is that the video clocks aren't phase-locked, which means that even if they were running at exactly the same rate, their sample times can still be different because their time base hasn't been started at the same time. Um, so even if you could arrange for all your cameras to be instructed to start at precisely the right time, depending on the camera model, um, they could still differ by plus or minus 10 milliseconds in their frame, in the actual frame sample time. And that's starting to approach the, uh, if you've got audio, which is synchronised to one camera, if you take another camera's frames that have been recorded slightly later, if it's a close-up camera, you can sometimes just get the feeling that something's not quite right. Often you can't quite put your finger on it, but you just know that it's not looking natural and it's because of this slight timing issue. Um, and that's mostly why, if you've got multi-cameras, I tend to prefer to, uh, to sort of synchronise to the close-up because that's the camera that you'll most likely notice it with. If you've got a large event and you've got a, lot, a long close-up, oh, sorry, a wide-angle shot, and you've got a single person or a group of people who are doing stuff or singing or whatever, because you can't see their detailed facial expressions, if that's out of sync by a small amount, it's far less noticeable than if you've got a real close-up of just the face and they're talking. 
that's hugely noticeable and very off-putting for the viewer. So that's why I say that, you know, try to prefer the close-up as a master in a multi-camera setup. But I'll admit that in some situations that doesn't work, it's not possible, often because the close-up isn't actually being used all that often in the final production. It, it depends a bit. There's a bit of artistic judgment that one has to apply to all this stuff in the end. So putting all this together, so we've got all our multi-tracks, you know, 16-track audio, one or multiple video um, tracks. Uh, if you've just got multi-audio tracks, um, depending on the project, Ardor or Audacity would be the port of call. I tend to always use Ardor um, because of the flexibility, the obvious flexibility that it um, gives when you're doing these sorts of things. Um, the context of this is like 16-track audio multi-tracks, um, and that you know, Ardor is the obvious choice for that. Um, if you've got multiple recorders and their start times aren't synchronous, then you'll have to do in a, in your chosen um, editor, when you drag all those resampled audio things in, you will have to nudge the tracks to time align the individual tracks because their start times aren't aren't exactly the same uh, aren't exactly at the same time, and you'd basically use something very similar to this. You'd zoom in on the waveform display. You'd have your two waveforms, top and bottom. You'd put the cursor at some sort of reference point and then move one or the other to time align their waveforms as best you can. Um, there's no, unless you can arrange to have all your recorders start at the same time, there's no way around that. It's just something that has to be done. Um, if you've got audio with video, which is a context that most of this has come from in my, in my situation, um, the workflow I tend to use is I start with the video and I'll actually construct the basic video track in Cinerella or whatever NLE you you tend to want to use, um, and that will involve doing the audio, doing the video cuts, and working with the reference audio that's synchronised to that video at, at that time. So if I cut video, I'll cut audio. Um, you get a rough guide track for the video, which basically fixes the time of the project, and then render out an audio guide track from the video. That would then be loaded into Ardor and form the master track against which all the other recorders were synchronised. And if you've done video cuts, you'll have to cut the audio from your audio recorders and then do a resynchronise at the cut point to make sure that everything stays in sync. It's tedious at times, especially if you've got like dozens and dozens of cuts in the audio. Um, but um, if, that, if, you're, you, if you're limited to doing, it, doing recordings with this sort of gear, then that's the price, I guess, you pay for not, uh, or, you know, for using the gear that can't be synchronised. And you know, I still have, cam I still run with cameras that aren't, can't be synchronised. So this is the workflow I use. It still costs me less time to do this than it would to buy a camera that I could actually synchronise with an external word clock. So there's a bunch of links um, for the for the. Uh, programs that I've sort of mentioned in passing this afternoon, most of which are fairly well known. The Audio Sync and Batch Rec are on my website, or one of them, um, and all the others are fairly self-explanatory. But instead of copying all that down, there's a URL at the top there that just basically contains this set of slides plus the one for the FATO update. And uh, if you go to that website, it's very, very simple. You just grab the PDF of the presentation and all the links are on there as well. And that's my email address. If anybody wants to contact me about any of this stuff, I'd be happy to sort of produce or give more detail or explanation about the steps that are required. So, and that's how I solve synchronisation issues when I can't afford to have word clock locked devices. Just out of curiosity, what is the cost? Okay, the question was, what's the rough, clock, what rough cost of a video sync to master clock box, basically? So something that takes the video signal and gen locks an audio clock to it. Um, that does depend a bit. Um, the cheap ones, there, there is actually a Motu device, I think they call it the MIDI man or something, which could in fact do this. You'd plug in a video signal and it'll produce an audio clock out. 
the problem with that, and that on the second-hand market, at least in Australia, you, could, you can sometimes pick them up for around about 500 Australian dollars. The problem is that as soon as you rip the video plug out, the audio clock disappears. Now, I'm not willing to take that risk because basically what that means is that the camera goes down for whatever reason or the camera signal goes down for whatever reason. Not only do you lo potentially lose your video recording, but you also lose the audio recording because all your devices that are suddenly depending on that clock suddenly can't do anything because they've lost their clock. So, um, again, some people will be willing to take that risk in the events that I'm recording I can't afford to. Um, the events that I was recording, the audio was arguably more important than the video as well, so if the audio failed because of a glitch on the video side, it was unacceptable. So, to, um, to get back to your question, the RME Fireface 800 has an add-on um, called the TCO option, time clock option, I think is what they, what they call it. Um, and that will do the same thing. It will accept the video input. It will generate a uh, word clock from that. But importantly, if the video disappears, the word clock continues at the last known rate. This is driving me nuts. I designed one of these things... This is driving me nuts. I designed one of these things for a company I worked for 10 years ago and if the video source wasn't there, they freewheeled. And they were real high resolution. They were plus or minus 50 parts per million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's the freewheel. <laughs> and, 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 sorry, the parts cost of that back in the late 90s was about $400 Australian. Yeah, the exp it's, it's actually not that expensive to do it properly. Um, but unfortunately, on, uh, as far as if you went out and bought something, the, I mean, so to give, it, to give a rough idea, the Fireface 800 in Australia is around about four to $5,000, and the time clock option uh, and the time code option for that retail is around six or $700. So it's an, that is an obscenely expensive solution. But at the same time, in defence of that, you're also paying for a 56-channel audio interface that you may or may not be using. Um, there are other options around. I think the Apogee Big Ben uh, clock generator also free wheels. But again, that's around 3500 Australian, I think. Um, Everything Apogee is expensive. Yeah. Um, and there, there are a handful of other um, Genlock devices around as well. Um, but, yeah, they are expensive, and you are right. In terms of cost, it's actually not that expensive to do. There is an analog, there's actually an analogue devices chip, uh, a DDS chip that they released um, about three years ago, which I think retails for less than $150, I think, about $120, I think. And um, that, The and solution I did years ago, we didn't want to use that because of possible patent problems with uh, Pro Tools, um, I was working for Fairlight ESP at the time, mm -hmm. and um, the one we did actually used five um, voltage-controlled crystal oscillators, and we actually had, we did 48K and all the multiples, 96 and so on. Um, we did 44K1, oh, sorry, we did 48, 44K1 plus the drop frame up, drop frame down, and something else, which I don't remember. So we actually ended up with five of these clocks mm -hmm. switchable in an FPGA. But yep. yeah. So that was, that was the maximal solution for that, and it was still only 400 bucks yeah. in parts. That's it. Um, the AD chip, I mean, you, wouldn't have, you couldn't have used the AD. You said early 2000s, did you? Uh, late 90s. Late 90s, yeah. Was, this chip I'm talking about was only released about two years ago. Um, and, yeah, and I actually was contemplating building something based on this AD chip. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's not that expensive. Um, in fact, it's quite possible that um, Digi actually use that chip in some of their stuff. Um, yeah, so it's not that... It's actually marketed basically as a Genlock chip. Um, it, do, it can be set up to freewheel. It basically does everything you'd want it to do, and you could certainly build something based on that chip for less than about $400 Australian dollars. Um, but for some reason, no one markets anything in that sort of price range that's really suitable for doing this sort of stuff. And it's really, really annoying, because if they did, I would buy one, because it's a really neat solution to the problem. Um, yeah.
<laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to derail the, your, what you're saying. But um, have you considered, um, have you try, experimented at all with trying to fit the, uh, the two things together with some kind of correlation function so you could automate finding the reference points or aligning all of your tracks with the, the, refer the guide audio? Um, I thought about it um, for a very short period of time. Uh, the biggest problem is that, again, with these sorts of events, you've got a huge range of inputs. Um, and you, know, you, you might have some close mic stuff on instruments. You've got a, a whole bunch of vocal microphones that are at various times in various places. Um, and you've got room mics that you're trying to synchronise to. Um, and you're trying to do all this with the camera. And especially if your reference is a room mic of any description, whether it's on camera, off camera, or whatever, um, the amount of reverberation that's added to the audio by the room um, completely confuses a correlation function. Um, you'll get far too many false peaks on your correlation function that you'll spend just as much time trying to work out which one is actually the correct one. Um, that it doesn't really become a feasible alternative in this situation. If your master's, if your master was, if it was all well defined and you didn't have a lot of reverb on the on the channels because it was all close mic'd and low gain and all that, um, it might work. But again, it would depend on the microphone's relative position to the reference event, because what this is, what this does rely on is that your master, um, your master channel, he is the same event as at least one of the channels on your multi-track recorder. And if they're in vastly different positions, the waveform, gen the general waveform shape of those events could be quite different. And this is why there's a lot of artistic interpretation often involved in that finding the, mas you know, finding the start of that master, um, the master event. In this case here, we've got what would basically count as a, as a, ver as a close mic situation. There's practically nothing and then, bang, you have the reference event. It's very clear cut. Um, unfortunately, I didn't um, bring an example of a room mic. But often what happens is that your room mic has room noise in it, especially if it's at the start of an event. There's audience noise and this sort of thing. Um, so you've, you, know, you don't have a zero noise floor. You've got a finite one. And then somewhere buried in that is, the, is, a, is a drum beat or something. Um, and again, all that adds to the confusion of a, of a correlation analysis. So yes, I did think of doing something like that. Um, it, it was very, very attractive. Um, but just a cursory glance at the, re of the, at the relevant waveforms very quickly showed that um, a correlation-based analysis would just get confused and require an awful lot of manual intervention in the, first, in, in the uh, second uh, step anyway. So, so it's yeah. a fair amount of work to pick out these uh, it can be. I mean, I should add that if you've got like a 16-track audio interface like I've got, um, you only have to do this to one of those 16 tracks. Because they're all because with each other. Because by definition, they're in the same recorder. They are all locked to each other. So you do it in one and you instantly know the timing of all the other 15 tracks. So you know, in, in my cases, I have to do it to, for example, the room mic of the camera, which is my master in my cases, um, I would pick out one of my multi-track recording, um, recordings and uh, channels, use that. And then in, this, in the show that I've been doing, um, often they'd also use backing tracks on CD. So I'd actually have to do the same process to the CD tracks so that I can resynchronize the backing tracks to the recorded vocal mics. So for my situation, yes, I was running 8 to 16 tracks, but the process of having to find the master in each was fairly well, uh, well defined. Um, if you've got multiple tapes for the event, which is what I was having, you'd have to do it for each tape. Um, but again, it was, it was a doable proposition, even though the total number of channels was quite large. So yeah, it was, I, I, I came to the conclusion that the correlation analysis just was going to be quite awkward to get working. And I don't, I don't honestly think it would have worked very well at all. Is it not worth sparing one of those channels as a sync channel and generating your own transient near the camera so that you pick up the camera audio and a, a sync signal which isn't subject to yeah. reverberation? Yeah, you, you can use a clapboard for sure. Or something, um, and then you but can again, sync everything else against that all the way through. 
Yeah, you, you can do that. Um, if, if you've got the option, you can certainly do that. Um, in the context of the events that I've been recording, um, it just wasn't possible to do that. Um, I was, um, to put this into context, I was recording events, um, two acts over three hours, um, basically 90, minute, 90 minutes per act. Um, DV tape is 90 minutes. So I couldn't afford to start the tape too far in advance because otherwise I'd run out at the other end and have to put another one in midstream. Um, and all the vocal mics were all backstage. I'm at the back of the auditorium. Um, there was no way I could um, get things to work to be able to do something like that in the context of that event. Certainly in other situations, uh, yes, you can use a clapper board or just hold a mic and clap next to it or something like that. You've still got to do. you still got to find those master events, but if you can do it right, it could be easier than having to rely on ambient stuff that's part of the program. So yes, certainly that's an option. In my situation, I couldn't do that. Do any of these cameras um, put out linear time code, or is that too old school? Um, some do, yes, um, but I can't afford them. <clears throat> I mean. To, again, to put this into context, things are a bit different now. Um, when I bought the TRV900 over 10 years ago now, um, it was a 3CCD camera. It was very new. Most of them weren't that, like, weren't that, uh, weren't 3CCD back in those days. Um, DV was relatively new. It's still a new thing. Um, that cam cost um, around about $4,000 new in Australia. Um, at the time, if I wanted to get a camera that was going to do time code in any guise, whether it had a word clock option on it or just put out linear time code, um, $10,000, $15,000, I couldn't afford it. Um, now, obviously, the cost of three chip CCD cameras has come down somewhat in the last 10 years. You can pick them up for a you know, reasonable one start around about two, three thousand dollars um, $3,000. But again, if you want to get those that have time code option things in it, you're still looking at around about seven to ten grand because it's really, uh, it's, it's deemed a professional feature and so you've got to buy a professional camera to get it and of course that includes all the other professional features that you may or may not need. Um, if you had it outputting time code, um, that's, you could then feed that into your audio device that accepts time code and then gen lock to that for sure. Um, video sync to timecode is actually a relatively easy conversion. That's that's twenty or thirty dollars worth of parts, and that would actually give you an audio signal. That's actually a, and and then sorry, then you can actually um, pull out all the manual parts here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just don't do hardware anymore. So <laughs> you're hard. basically saying dedicate an audio channel to recording the yeah. LT, uh, LTC, yeah. You can talk the time code. Yes, you, you can. Um, yes, you can. You can write a program that picks out that. And in fact, doing something along those lines was another thing that I thought of doing um, about six years ago or something, doing up the hardware to do it. The problem was I actually didn't have enough audio channels. Um, I had, at the time, eight analogue. I was using all eight at the event and I didn't have an easy way of being able to convert an analog audio signal into ADAT, which was the other option, or SPDIF, which was the other option I had. Um, and at the time, it basically became all too hard. Um, so yeah, but certainly that is, again, if you've got the audio channels, um, that is a relatively straightforward option to do to, to, gener to generate some sort of plip or blip um, and record that, or even go the whole hog, do linear time code and do it that way. Although, if you're going to do linear time code, then you do need some way of getting the timing info out of the camera. Which you can sometimes do with LANC. Free, free yeah. Relative time code, right? Yeah, relative, yes. yes. And then you could do it. And certainly that would be an, another option. Um, and if you did that, then you could automate some of this resampling stuff. You could seek out those peaks. Um, you'd probably still have to count them. So it would still be a fairly time-consuming task for the, pro for the computer, but it would be good at doing that. That would allow one to automate some of these steps, for sure, if you had the resources. Have you ever had to deal with nonlinear time drift from thermal variation? <laughs> uh, inherently, always, yes. Um, again, I, the way I tend to minimise that 
Oh, sorry, the question was, have I ever dealt with uh, thermal or time drift resulting from thermal variations in the temperature of the gear? Um, yes, and I've, I've seen it happen. Um, the way I've tended to avoid it, basically, is uh, turn the gear on several hours before I'm going to use it. Um, again, most of these events were such that I had a, a fairly lengthy setup time, um, often during tech rehearsal, which went as long as the event itself. Um, so that meant that I could get stuff in early, get the gear up and on so it was running, and then worry about all the interconnect cables and all the other stuff that I was doing. What this meant was, and, and basically what I was hoping, was that by the time the event came around, things had more or less stabilised thermally and weren't going to vary as much as if I just turned it on cold and then it ramps up during the course of the first 10, 15 minutes of the event. Um, now, having said that, it's not an ideal solution because there'll be thermal variations all the way through it. Um, there are drifts. Um, however, if you have allowed things to stabilise and you use these techniques, it turns out that it's quite acceptable, um, in, in my experience anyway, with, with the footage that I've been shooting. Um, but, yeah, look, it, it's an occupational hazard when you've got unlocked clocks that they will... Drift at different times, you know. Think they'll respond to variation in temperature in different ways, and effectively, what this process is doing is averaging out those variations over the course of the event, um, and hoping that you don't have huge disparities and huge temperature gradients during the event. And in most cases, that's a valid assumption. If it turns out not to be, you can usually detect this because suddenly something's way out of sync in the middle, and you don't know why, and that would be the reason. In which case. Um, the solution would be to divide your thing up into multiple segments and do this resyncing on separate segments, um, which I've, only, I've had to do that once, but there were extenuating circumstances and I know what caused the issue at the time. So, yeah, it is a problem you've got to be aware of, but in most cases, practically speaking, uh, you can get away with not having to worry about it because it averages out over time. Okay, well, I hope that's been helpful and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>